You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! We've got uh, a very interesting person. Person? Uh, we'll get the gender, what, gender neutral here, so he's a very... He is a very interesting person with a very interesting name. Uh, so we'll just say straight out that we've got Tim Watson in the uh, house. Uh, Tim Watson Munro. Uh, you must get uh, that a lot, Tim. Uh, Tim Watson. Oh, Munro, is it? Um, they surely don't confuse you with the Brownlow medal. There's who, a slight height difference. Incidentally, who had his Brownlow medal taken off him in the most mm. disgracefully stupid way. But uh, if you got disgracefully stupid people running the AFL in those days, that's what they'd do. Uh, oh, my God. What is this man doing walking in? <laughs> anyhow, Jesus H. Christ. Hang on. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, so, um, I know, uh, uh, Ricky Nixon has uh, entered the house. A- anyhow, Tim Watson Munro has uh, come in to have a chat to us about... He is a criminal psychologist. That's it. And he, I presume that means that you explain to people who have uh, been done egregious things in the community why they've done them and uh, give them some... Um, not credibility, but you under- try and understand why they've done those things that they have. Is that basically right, Tim? Oh, basically. I don't treat them. I assess them. I prepare reports and I give evidence in court about those reports. You assess and treat individuals about why they have I done... Don't, I don't treat. Just the assessment. So somebody breaks into a bank... The lawyer will send that person to me. I'll do a psychological workup, do a report. Report goes to court, but um, I don't treat. So if someone breaks into a bank, you don't uh, try and um, oversee the mental stability of the people that the bank robber confronted. You speak to about the bank robber. That's correct. Although years ago, decades ago... I set up a business that did all the trauma debriefing for the major four banks in Australia, the National, ANZ, Westpac, and I think it was the Commonwealth as well. So I used to do a lot of work with victims, but these days, Sam, it's really assessment work. That's it. So, Tim, it says, it it just says here that uh, you treat substance abuse disorders in people? You treat, it says. So you. Who who says that? Well, let me see if I can... Uh, you just chat on. I'll just see if I can get who says that. <laughs> because that's a misnomer. I don't do any treatment right. these days. Yeah. I used to, but yeah. not in oh, the present. Oh, you used to. Well, yeah. they mightn't have updated the... Yeah, uh, could well be. They mightn't have updated the... the Wikipedia uh, page. thing that I looked at. Oh, Wil- Wikipedia is... Um, yeah, it's not my major source material. So, Tim, mm. so, so if uh, you have a, uh, an egregious... Um, I've used that word again. If you have a, someone who has uh, transgressed, like Julian Knight mm. or um, um, Alphonse Gingitano or any person out there that has done uh, antisocial things, you try and understand what made them do that, do you? That's Is it, that, yeah. And, and to, for whom? For uh, courts or for juries to make a, an assessment or for what? It's fundamentally for the court via their lawyer, their barrister, their defending solicitor. So the, uh, the, the, the people, the, uh, the prosecution, would treat you as a bit of a uh, thorn in their side because you probably do you not uh, try and justify why these people have done those things while you don't agree with them. You say, well, they, had a, they weren't in charge of their faculties at the time. Or uh, How complicated is all that to try and get into the back of someone like that's brain? It, it varies according to the crime, the individual. I don't try and justify their behaviour, more explain it. I think that uh, there's a difference. I mean, I don't empathise with these people. Yeah, but it, there is a difference. Of um, course. So I explain what was going on with this person from the cradle to the grave almost. You take a comprehensive history of their life, parents, schooling, drug use, alcohol use, relationship history, Mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Um, Would you be somebody who declares whether somebody is legally sane or not? Only if I'm asked to. Um, Most of these cases, they've already... There's been a determination of guilt... Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm more involved in what would be described as the sentencing process rather than the 
determination of right or wrong, guilt or innocence. Mm. I read from your um, bio, uh, Tim Watson Munro. I have been practising in Melbourne and Sydney since 1981. I am involved in the assessment and treatment of individuals in all jurisdictions, both civil and criminal. I have also considerable expertise in the treatment of substance misuse disorders. That's absolutely correct in terms of that bio. I just don't treat anymore. Oh, I see. So you, I beg your pardon. So mm. I reckon I'm. The, I reckon it's one all. New I reckon ball. we're both right. I reckon it's one all. <laughs> one all new balls, please. Yeah, that's uh, it. I reckon, yeah, new balls. So, so I, uh, I haven't got the updated version. So, um, I've just this is a specific case, but and in, I don't think you would have uh, been around, or oh, you certainly would have been around, but I'm not sure that you would have. I'm had a septuagenarian. A cycle of, so I'm no, I, I didn't. Around. No, I, I didn't mean. <laughs> I can see when you started in 1981. Uh, there's a man called. Uh, there's a man called. Now let me just get his name. He's a man called Arthur Freeman, who threw his daughter off the top of the Westgate Bridge. I in, recall the case. Yes, mm. in 2009. And I remember the man that we're going to speak to, Ben Fordham, I didn't even know Ben Fordham, but I said somewhere that I felt sorry for him that someone would get in that much of a state of uh, disorder and uh, their mental acuity would d- 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 desert them, that mm. they think they could have to stop on a bridge and throw their kid off. And I, he ripped the living suit. Ca- he said, you feel sorry for him? I said, mate, listen to what I'm saying. He deserves everything he's get. It's a disgra- obviously a disgraceful thing, but what sort of thing would be going through someone's mind to pull your car up with your two other kids in it, throw them off the bridge, and have their people who he didn't throw off the bridge, the young kids, say, oh, uh, Sally or whatever her name is, uh, her name was Danielle, I think, or, or <coughs> can't even can't swim, Dad. Uh, I mean, mm. <laughs> seriously, how, how would you get into the back of that person's... This was a domestic dispute yeah. with his ex-wife... Mm-hmm. How would you get into the back of that person's I mind? I recall the case. Well, I guess the real issue would be, was he aware of what he was doing at the time, the consequences of what he was doing? Was he legally insane as opposed to medically insane? And uh, well, What's the difference? So, well, well so he that's said, a big difference. Tim, he yeah. said he, cl- he claimed that at the trial and, and that was dismissed probably because of the veracity and the... I mean, if you had someone saying, oh, he's not guilty on the basis that he's mentally insane, uh, all hell would have broken loose. I suppose people get intimidated, not you, but people like you would get intimidated not to say, well, look, uh, he wasn't in control of his... It's a, it's a pretty fine line, isn't it? It seemed to me, and I didn't assess him, that's the caveat, I don't know him. <laughs> yep, no, but I in, said that. But, but in general principles, anyone who can plan something like that. It didn't seem to be spontaneous. Uh, it would suggest a degree of organisation that you don't get with crazy people. But I would defer to whoever examined him uh, and the determination was that he wasn't crazy or at least legally crazy. And you're asking the question, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of behaviour I encounter, the bloke, the person, the person in the mm-hmm. street mm-hmm. would say, that's mad. That's crazy, yeah. insane behaviour. But um, the rules on legal insanity are very tight and they go back a long way. And to be judged insane legally, you have to demonstrate the person was unaware of the difference between right and wrong. They didn't know there was wrongdoing and they were unaware of the consequences of their actions. Now, in this case, it would seem, based on what I've read, that he was aware of both. He was aware of what he was doing and the consequences of what he was doing, and that hence the determination. Is organisation is organisation one of the kind of defining factors if one appears organised? But couldn't somebody who's psychotic appear organised? You know what I mean. Some psychotics oh, are organised. They are, but generally not. You know, mm-hmm. um, generally their thinking is shambolic. You know, they've got uh, voices talking to them. They Someone like Ted Bundy, for example, is clearly psychotic, but you know what I mean, like. Where well, does that, you clearly know, but he was well organized in well. the sense of what we were talking about. People say, well, how can you go out and do what Ted Bundy did? He was organised, he was a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, he wasn't legally insane. He was a psychopath, mm-hmm. a serial-killing psychopath. So I know you, I know you um, 
didn't treat. I know you um, <laughs> um, conversed with um, the first person, I think, that was convicted on the anti-terrorism law, Mr. Um, Fahim Lodi. Lodi. Yes, Lodi. Uh, so Lodi. So uh, he... How would you, he? How would this was a premeditated thing? He is. Uh, he he was out to um, harm people who weren't of his religion or faith or whatever. H- how would you? What did you? Did you eyeball those? Did you eyeball him? Do you eyeball the people that oh, you yeah. speak to, like Genjitano and Knight and uh, Julian Knight? And you eyeball them and you try I and. Do. How would you? I did. How would you assess? Mm. How, how how? What would you say? Because that. What would you say to that person? Well, I remember Lodi well, and uh, I interviewed him out at the uh, MRRC. It's a maximum security jail in Sydney, and they brought him to me in a what I'd describe as a Guantanamo Bay suit. You know those yep, orange yep, yep, jumpsuits. Yep. Um, he was shackled and manacled, <laughs> and they had two like big burly, you know like Ruckman-type prison officers. Was this just for effect? Well, I don't know. I, didn't, I wasn't intimidated by him. He was an architect. He was an intelligent bloke. Clearly not nuts. And I don't think that it was even suggested that he was. I mean, he went to trial. He was just a political activist. Well, he Extremist. maintained he was innocent. Nobody believed him. Um, I didn't believe him, for what it's worth. Um, the jury didn't believe him. And uh, well, he, he... Just, Tim, what was he... What did he? Was he actually accused of plotting to bomb someone, or what? Or what? Yeah, he was. You may recall back in the day, there were a lot of ads around. You know, if you see someone looking suspicious, yeah, right. yep. all that stuff, you find something out your front door, call the police. Somebody did. They'd observed this guy and they thought he was suspicious, and the police started looking at him. And uh, the end result of that was that he was uh, plotting to let off bombs, blow up people in the name of his religion. Yeah. And uh, he was charged and uh, he was found guilty. He was sentenced to a lengthy term of imprisonment. I think he's coming up for parole soon. It's that long ago. But um, yeah, two thousand. Uh, 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 I can't remember what it was. I'm sorry, I haven't got that written down. Yeah, but um, he, uh, he wasn't crazy. You know, uh, there was no suggestion of insanity. Um, given what he was found guilty of, there was a... a compelling evidence that he was a very bad person mm-hmm. so, so if, I, if, I, if I am he sitting here <coughs> and you're, you, you are sent along or you are commissioned by the government or the courts or why are you there in the first place someone sends you there to assess this person on behalf of the yes. Commonwealth or no, the Crown on, or who on behalf of the defence in that yes. case and I would say 99% of the work I do in crime over the years has been for the defence, very occasionally for the Crown. So, so Tim, when I said that you would possibly be a thorn in the side of the prosecution, that's not too far from the truth. If, if of course, you find that there is a reasonable doubt about the person's sanity. Well, that's true, but I didn't with him. Um, I, I suggested that he wasn't insane. Um, it may well have been the case... By then, and look, you're stretching my memory too, that he'd already been found guilty and the defence lawyers wanted a psychological workup yeah. as to what's going on with so this could, bloke. See if they could hang their hat on anything that might uh, get him off. Yeah, or, there, or there weren't many hat pegs, I can tell you. So if I am he uh, mm. and you are sent along by... Uh, did we say who sent you along? The, the defence, yeah. yeah. His uh, QC. What, uh, what, how would... How would you start speaking to me? You'd say, how are you? And I'd say, good day, Sam. Get, would you like... get fucked or something? Was he cooperative? <laughs> they're, always, they're always cooperative. You yeah. know, I've seen... Basically, because you're on the same side. Well, no, really? I'm, no I'm, I like to think that I'm uh, really a, a witness for the court. Objective. Uh, uh, as best you can. But I can tell you, I've seen, uh, let's say, 30,000 people yeah, in I know, 45 that was years. My next a a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. Um, I think I've only been people. told to get stuff twice in that time. Yeah. Um, generally, they're cooperative. Generally, they're, you know... I mean, obviously, they think, well, if you're nice to Tim, he'll, he'll write a good report. Yeah, but that's yep, part absolutely. of it. But, um, so, you so, know, I'm so wizened I'm, and thorny these days. <laughs> so I'm here, I'm here and you say, well, you've been charged with these things, uh, whatever his name is, Fahid. Um, 
what say you? And he says, I haven't done any of this. And you, mm. well, how, where do you go from there? So, well, the evidence is pretty, uh, pretty credible. Well, by that stage with him, I mean, the evidence has been accepted. He was guilty, as I recall. Um, I don't go to the rights and wrongs so much in a case like that. It's looking at his background history. And that's the, one of the things that really amazed me about this guy. Highly educated architect seemingly, you know, well assimilated in the Australian community. He had a, a wife and all of a sudden you're charged with something that potentially carries life and you're looking at a lot of jail. Mm. And um, What are some of the psychological motivators for someone who's like a political extremist or, you know, terrorist? What are some of the things you oh, look for? Look, I think unbridled, seething anger is one of them. Um, there's a lot of, uh, and I don't, I don't use this as an exculpatory reason, but a lot of these people are brainwashed by what they see and what they read and the, the people they hang out with. And uh, at some point they cross the Rubicon and they decide they just want to go out and kill people. And uh, Lodi's one that I've assessed. I've assessed quite a number of them over the years. Um, there's common themes relating to fanaticism about what they believe in. Mm -hmm. So what was the fanaticism of, say, Julian Knight, who I think you... Uh, yeah. Uh, dealt with, dealt with if that's not, not the word, but you uh, communicated with uh, on a pleasant day. Apparently, uh, just went down Hoddle Street and shot up yeah. uh, how many, 14 or 15 Eight. people? Eight, did he? Yeah, and sorry. wounded about 30. And, and, and you shot down the police helicopter. So yeah. he wasn't a bad shot. Hmm. No, and, an, you, yeah, and, and, marksman. and as by all accounts, quite an intelligent person. Highly intelligent yep. black. And He's a good example, too, of what we're talking about. Um, and he's a guy that I saw well ahead of the pending trial. I think I saw him within a few weeks, maybe a month of Hoddle Street, and I remember it well, uh, going down to the old Pentridge jail. He was in the prison hospital. I didn't know what I would encounter, given what he'd done. And uh, what I found was a very kind of diminished teenager... Uh, he had long hair at that stage from memory and he was very respectful. I, I didn't know if that was a military training, whatever it was, but the issue was, given what he's done, which is clearly crazy behaviour, is he insane? And um, I was one of a number of people that saw him. Uh, my former business partner, late forensic psychiatrist David Syme saw him Another forensic psychologist, Ken Byrne, saw him. Quite independent of one another, we came to the same view that he was not insane in a legal sense. What was his motivation? Oh, look. He had a bad could, day. Who knows? You know, he said he was having well, a what bad did he day. say? Did he, have any, did he have a political agenda? Was it just a lashing out of people in general? Was it misanthropic? Or? It, he uh, was certainly misanthrope. And... Uh, there was a lead up to it. Um, he went to Duntroon. He'd always wanted to be a soldier and an officer and ironically a gentleman. And he went to Duntroon. It was an abject failure for him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of evidence uh, to suggest that he was bullied at Duntroon. He came from Clifton Hill. Uh, for those younger people in the audience, Clifton Hill wasn't gentrified back then. It was more of a sort of worker suburb. Working class, yep. And he was, um, he was seen as being a guy from the wrong side of the track. So almost from the beginning, um, it went south for him. Okay. And uh, he was eventually, uh, you know, subject to episodes of bastardisation. He was confined to barracks. And prior to Hoddle Street, he went AWOL from Duntroon, turned up at the private bin nightclub in Canberra, which is where all the Duntroon cadets hung out, and he stabbed his mess sergeant. Uh -huh. But um, the mess sergeant was one year older than him. They have this sort of mm. hierarchy. hierarchy of rank, uh, and they're all boys, really, in long pants. And uh, arising from that, he was put into hospital. Remarkably, he wasn't psychiatrically evaluated. His dad was a captain in the army, he was a linguist and he was fluent in, uh, I think, Mandarin and Cantonese and those sorts of things. He got him out of Canberra, sent him back to Clifton Hill and it just spiraled even further. Was, was his parents aware of his um, 
his uh, mental state or, or I only ask that because just yesterday in America mm. the parents of a boy who killed four people at a school young lad yep. they've charged the parents with neglect as in um, being complicit in the crime because they should have warned the community or the police that their son was uh, a danger. A danger, yeah. I read that and I think they were convicted, in fact. They, they, they were convicted. So it's, it's a landmark watershed case, yes. that, mm. about parents being more responsible for their kids. I endorse it. Um, I don't think he was showing any signs of what he was about to do, Sam. Uh, the interesting thing is he had three firearms at home back in the day when firearms were far less regulated uh, and they were high-powered weapons that had been given to him by various family members guns are in one cupboard, the ammunition's in another. He comes home, he'd had a big drink. He'd been to his grandmother's birthday party and he drove a Holden Tirana and the clutch failed. I said it was a metaphor for his life. He kangaroo hopped the car back to Mum's at yeah. Clifton Hill, went out and had a drink, had a blue with the public and thrown out and then he went home grab the guns, and the rest is history. Mm. So there was no indication to them beyond, I would suggest, the fact that he had stabbed a mess sergeant beforehand at Duntroon. So I made the comment, you know, it's remarkable he wasn't evaluated at that time. Is there some similarity between Julian Knight and someone like Martin Bryant in Tasmania? I mean, no, he was, no. Did you have anything to do with his assessment or did you examine his case at all? Um, I examined his case, but I had a conflict of interest because by that time... Um, I was seeing a number of the people who had been in the cafe. Oh, I see. Yeah. And one of them had been shot. In fact, this guy and his wife were standing behind Bryant, talking to him, and then he pulled out the gun and... Jesus. It, you know, it's a scene out of a movie. They jumped mm -hmm. under a table, a table a bit like your desk, Sam, and they could see him walking up and down with a, with a gun. So um, I saw the victims. There were no real similarities. My understanding... So I haven't examined um, Martin Bryant... Um, there's a great movie that came out last year, Nitrum. Nitrum, isn't that good? Yeah. Is, yeah, the same it. guy produced Snowtown, and it um, looks at the psychology of yep. uh, Bryant. My understanding is he had a very low IQ, he was possibly on the spectrum, um, he'd been given a lot of money, mm -hmm. he was befriended by a woman who was then killed in a car accident. There was some suggestion uh, Martin might have um, had some role in that, who yep. knows? And, you know, he, uh, he too was not found insane, as I understand it. Mm. Um, this is probably not your purview, uh, but uh, do you think we abandoned uh, capital punishment here for people who were absolutely no value at all to the community, no matter what you say? Uh, do you think... Um, wh why would we keep people like that uh, on the planet? Well, I think or a lot of people... barbaric? Well, people raise that question and I said, I'm getting wizened and thorny, you know. Yeah. Years ago, um, I just thought it was barbaric. I still think it's uncivilised. I can understand why people would ask that question. Why aren't these people put to death? I guess, amongst other things, uh, what's the greater punishment for them? You know, to yes, be killed or point. to be you can get locked up for the rest 30, of 40 years of your life. And yep. uh, what I hear about Bryant is his life is miserable. You know, I read an article where he, you know, he swapped sexual favours for ice creams and chocolates and that's what his life's been redacted to. So that's to. Probably, probably better to keep him alive and have him go through that. Oh, well, that's a bit... Hard to say that, isn't it? Uh, I, I think his crime. Mind you, poor. it costs us, you and me, it costs it costs a hundred grand a year to keep people alive who shouldn't be on the planet, doesn't it? Or well, probably more. It, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. It's certainly expensive. I think in some cases it could well be justified the death penalty. You know, I mean, I think obviously America still has it, and um, America's I'd still thinking it, I'd up support new it ways. In cases like Brian's, you know, very but, very few people get the death penalty, don't they? It's just sort of a um, nice buzzword to appease the general population who uh, can't believe that someone has done a 
very vicious thing. Unless you live in Texas. Yeah, yeah. And they're lining them up like ducks and just bowling them over every day. Are they? In Texas, oh, yeah. They're, they're still doing that, are they? Oh, yeah. They, they, I think Texas executes more people than anyone, except perhaps China. So Knight and um, Bryant, they're, they're sort of people who just... What about career criminals like uh, Alphonse Gingitano? How would you possibly get into the back of that person's brain and say, what, what do you do this for? I know what you do it for, but uh, you spent the best part of your life keeping out of jail or being in jail. What's the point of being on the planet, Alphonse? Well, he was an interesting guy, and I hear you, but he was an intelligent bloke. His father, as you probably know, was well-respected in the Italian community. He was a travel agent, Philip Gangitano. Alphonse had promise, but it was just, uh, you know, he went off the rails very early. He was, by all accounts, was always wanting to be a gangster. But I used to talk to him about, you know, Oscar Wilde. We used to talk about literature and so on. And um, I said, your life could have been very different, you know, but uh, it's not too late. But what do you think makes... it was too late because he was murdered. Mm. What makes somebody who is intelligent like that kind of choose a life of crime? I mean, because obviously he could have succeeded as a nightclub owner or, you know what I mean? I think he could have succeeded, you know. He was a charismatic, intelligent bloke who just took the wrong path. Uh, why do they do it? They, they like the excitement. Yeah. They like the power, the limelight. The limelight. Mm -hmm. They like the fear that they instil in others. I, I can remember, you know, I had an office in St Kilda Road years ago in the medical centre, and that's where he came to see me. And when he walked in, the other crooks in the waiting room ran out. Right. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were just... Oh, you know. And at the end of it, he said, look, I really like seeing... He used to call me Doc, as some do, but I don't... I, could we meet downstairs? Because I don't want these blokes to think I'm crazy. Right? Yeah. So a lot of ego involved, yeah. too, you know, but he was an interesting guy. Uh, so so um, you're an expert in profiling uh, people. If you had lined up a whole group of people here, you can... Can you assess who you think uh, <laughs> is uh, about to be ridiculous or do something antisocial? And then uh. you get into the very controversial thing of racial profiling and uh, then you'll be accused of all those words of being racist and xenophobic and that. But that's part of what you do, I presume. I don't racially profile, but race will come into the profile, if I could put it that way. But, no, that's um, what I mean. Yeah. Yes. So... Um, Sitting at this table, I don't know. I mean, you and I go back a long way. I think we met when I was on 3AW yep. with yep. Ian McMinn. That's right, McMinn, that McMinn, my oh, goodness me. Yeah. Yep. He, he lives in the Northern Territory Does he? now, I gather. Yeah, I liked Ian. He, you that, liked to drink, Ian? He, he liked to drink. He liked to drink. <laughs> I don't know day. if he still does, and cold days, and no, any day would do. No, hot day, he used yeah. to just have a sip. <laughs> and uh, got him into a bit of strife, but he was he was a very interesting... He was a good man. I he was a good him. man yeah. and an intelligent bloke. He was. And I liked him a lot. But that was the late 80s, so that's when we met, I think. Um, how do you profile people? You need to spend time with them. You need background information. Uh, generally, with the work I get, I ask for a very comprehensive brief from the lawyers... And some are very good at that, some are not good at it at all, and then you have to do your own sort of research. Medical history is important, school history is important, um, criminal history is very important. You've also profiled people who haven't been caught yet, like people like Mr Cruel. You apparently mm. did a psychological profile. I mean, is there a group in, in Australia like the way that the FBI has psychological profilers for, for things like uncaught serial killers? Or, and have you been involved with that much? Or am I only just Mr Cruel case? Uh, look, years ago, I um, used to be retained by Vic Pohl. You know, I've had a number of academic positions. You know, I was at Melbourne Uni for a while, Bond Uni. I was a visiting professor there. But in the early days, I was a lecturer at Philip Institute, which is now part of RMIT. Mm. And there were quite a number of young and aspiring policemen who were doing the degree there. John Frame was one. He became the Deputy Commissioner. Uh, there were a whole lot of guys there. And um, it was through those connections that um, they started suggesting to the higher-ups that maybe we should get Tim or someone like Tim to have a look at this crime or this criminal. Mm -hmm. So Mr Cruel was one. I've done a number over the years. Um, 
I was asked about my lap before he was Caught even detected. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he's a serial killer. He's a marauding serial killer. If he's ever caught, I reckon he'll live close to an off-ramp off the Hume Highway. And, of course, he was. So um, I don't do a lot of it mm. these days, but back then I did a bit. There must yeah. be... Sorry, I'll just... No, we, you must notice um, we call Ivan... Uh, Ivan... Oh, no, no, this feel... Because Don Scott, he used to sit there and say, you look like... I can see the similar... <laughs> <laughs> respect. This, this can we have a stitch up Don if I've ever seen you look like Ivan <laughs> Malat, so we've been, and his missus. So. Do you get that a bit? <laughs> yeah, I, especially when I walk Pauline. in here. Yeah, well, you're yeah. far more charming, if I must say. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> Thank so, you. He was a shock. He's Ivan. a good-looking fellow. Did you meet him? Yeah. Yeah, go on. But anyway, the question is... Yeah, so there'll be a lot of people that... Criminals that you deal with, and they'd confide in you, all these atrocities and things like that. How well do you go back to your house at night and try and sleep and think of all these things? How do you turn off? Well, or do, or do you, turn Ivan? Off? That's a it's a very good question. And um, oh, these okay. days, no, I'll remember your name. <laughs> no, he's, Ivan, he's, he's Ivan. That's it's you. Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever people call you Malat? You know, <laughs> shut up, Malat. Uh, yeah. um, years ago, I, you know, I used to take it home. I used to sleep on it. You know, uh, it it led to me becoming very depressed for a while. You know, drinking uh, too much, using drugs for a while. It was very well publicised. Mm. I wrote oh, about right. it. But um, these days, I switch off. But I might add. These days, I'd rather spend an hour or two with Bill from Baldwin, who's charged with a drink drive, than, you know, the types of clients I used to have, yeah. the killers, the drug importers, you know, uh, I'm past you, all that. You would have heard quite a few stories from them that wouldn't have made it out into the media or into the public domain, so that would, some of those ones would have to be horrific. Well, you know, they tend to confine themselves to what they've done, but you look at their prior histories and, yeah, sure, it's, uh, I've said many times, it's not a job for the faint-hearted. Well, you say I've known you for, I didn't know you, I, I didn't know you uh, got to you and you uh, had a sip yourself and took drugs, did you? What mm. sort of drugs did you take? Uh, not now. No, uh, I know that. Years and years ago. No, I was... Uh, Give the Bolivian booger sugar a bit yeah, of a touch Yeah, I was, I was a marching dust. Where did you get that from? From oh. Alphonse Ginger? No, 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 no. <laughs> no names, no pact. No. But, um, it's a long time ago. But Gadgetan, I never, no, never from clients. Mm. No, that's it. That's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. Tim Watson. Munro. <laughs> <laughs> well, some... uh, so, uh, um, now I was just going to ask you... Do you think, this is probably not in your purview either, but it's uh, related, surely. Uh, crime is increasing. Uh, I, I don't care what the stats say. There's more horrendous acts going on of uh, vandalism and mm. hijacking and carjacking. And we saw the four people of, four youths of African appearance. They just looked as though they were African appearance. And there's plenty of uh, uh, horrendous things done by white people and blue people and green people. But they murdered that grandmother up in um, Queensland, which uh, uh, crime is on the up. Is this because of the lax penalties? Because we've got too many um, um, do, do gooders uh, uh, trying to say that. Too many lawyers that are on the... Uh, what am I trying to say? And not enough police yeah. and everything. Too many social uh, social lawyers... Justice warriors. Justice warriors trying to keep people out of the prisons because that's not the answer, they say. Well, it's a vexed issue and certainly the escalation in youth crime is very troubling... They tell us in this state that it's, uh, you know, it's a fiction, that it's not, it's not on the increase, but I read about it every day. Mm. And, you know, black, white, whatever race you may come yep. from, when kids are out, you know, carjacking, breaking into houses to steal cars, I've got to be careful about Brisbane, it may be sub judice now, but, you know, allegedly killing people for a motor vehicle, um, we need to... Uh, reinvent quite a bit, I think, in terms of how we're approaching these problems. So no matter what political persuasion you are, successive governments just lie about that because they say it's not good for the electorate for them to say they've lost control of youth crime or crime in general. So you would dismiss anything, 
any government says about that. It is on the increase and it's uh, pretty scary for people out there. Uh, once again, would, do you th- see what's happening overseas, the parents having been made to be more accountable for these people just out doing these things? Do you think that's likely to come in here or is that a step too far? I think parents should be more accountable. And I've been on a soapbox about this for decades, that it starts at Home, mm-hmm. social learning, teaching kids boundaries, you know, educating kids about the perils of adverse peer group associations, using drugs, uh, and it also should be in the classroom. You know, beyond the three R's in primary school, kids should be taught about communicating with others, problem solving, and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very complex, but at the end of the day, parents need to be accountable for what their kids do. And there needs to be more accountability, I believe. Yes, that's right, Tim Watson, Munro. But unless a court says, well, we are charging you with um, uh, neglect and you are indirectly being responsible, unless they actually have to be accountable to a court, it's all right to say all these things. Legal ramifications. It's all great to say it, but unless uh, someone's takes them to court and actually charges them with being complicit in what their kids have done, it'll never change. No one will take responsibility. Will will they? Well, I think that's probably right. I can remember years ago, and it was a long time ago, there was a kid who burnt down, I think it was a high school at Frankston, and the judge was Judge Nixon, a fabulous judge in my view on the uh, county court, And he raised the possibility of maybe the parents having to chip in for the repairs to the school, which is multi-million dollars. The interesting thing is the one thing that seems to get people's attention quicker than anything is the hip pocket nerve. Yes. You know, and if uh, parents... uh, If it hits them in the hip pocket. Mm. Yeah, if the parents have to fund some of their rehabilitation, repairs, reparations and and so on, might get their attention. And that's a legal... uh, That would be a legal direction from the court that the parents... Well, not at the moment. uh, Look, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't think I can speak as an expert on that, but psychologically it might have some impact if parents were led to or knew... If Johnny goes out and does this, they're going to be held accountable too. Having said that... uh, Having said that, um, have you ever spoken to a convicted or charged graffitiist who go round uh, defacing every single thing that has been built and if the parents were then asked to pay for the clean-up, have you ever spoken to a graffitiist who's been charged and asked him what goes on in that small brain of his? Uh, I have. And um, a lot of them, you know, ironic as it is, take great pride in their work. They see themselves as artists. Yeah, but they're, they're tag... The, the graffitiists, there's a bit of a subtle difference between a tagger and a graffitiist. When you say graffiti, you mean profanity on walls? Or are yeah, you talking just about art? writing yeah. crap yeah. over yeah. signs on the freeway and highway and defacing yeah. the sound barriers along the... West Coast. Or, or, what, what is the point of... Uh, that, that is, that, it's like... People who get tattoos. Uh, what is the point of all that? Uh, it's about anger. They're not crazy. They're angry. Um, they're bad, but you know they're not out killing people. Some would say, but um, no, they're they, not. They feel very, I think, alienated in some ways from mainstream society, and this is a way of expressing some sort of power, misdirected and misguided as it is. Well, that would get their parents' attention if they were asked to pay for the clean-up. Inevitably. Mm. But we talk about it, but no law comes in to say that mm. if your son or daughter does that, you are responsible in some sort of way. Well, you know, the legislators the- need to look at it, but uh, it seems that in some ways there's a lot of denial going on, isn't there, about the true extent of the problem. Mm. Do you well, believe in um, like like the bad seed that some people are kind of evil or, or such, or is it, or is it all you more behave, behavioralist where you think it's like a result of the way they were raised or you know like trauma during childhood? I mean, how do you, where do you sit on all that? Um, I think most people's behaviour is shaped mm. by a range of things: genetic, social learning, um, absence of consequences. But there are some people I reckon who are just born 
bad from day one. Mm. And you look at the kids that killed Jamie Bolger, for example. Mm -hmm. yep. Extraordinary case. A little boy murdered. Uh, on railway tracks in the UK, and the, the offenders, I think, were under the age of 10 or 11 years of age. What drives that? Who knows? But then you look, you know, decades on, mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of them was released to parole, as I understand it, never heard of again. Um, the other one, repeat offender, picked up with kiddie porn, he's back in jail, you know, it just goes on and on. Mm. So I think there are some people, you know, who are intrinsically bad but fortunately they're in the rare minority uh, well uh, you, pro you won't answer this question and rightly so but uh, maybe you, so you say you say that people are just born bad uh, very few yeah do you think people are just born to want to be a different gender <laughs> uh, look I don't know no. it's a short answer I, I really don't know um, I Mm. What would possibly have you come across trans in your profession? Well, I've, I've come across people who are transitioning in the context of breaking the law, mm -hmm. but you know I'm not there. Uh, to what's that mean, Tim? Break, uh, well, you know they've they've stolen something. Oh, they've got into a fight. Oh, I see. Yep. You know, and they're before the court. Oh, big button. Yep. Yeah, but, but their, I, their I, gender wouldn't play into yep. it as yep. such anyway. From well, your perspective, but you don't one deal case with that issue. it did. One case it did. Um, uh, a nice person, six foot four. He was a wharfie and he was transitioning. And well, he came so to see me and um, he, uh, he'd got into a bar fight because somebody had said something to him that he found offensive and he, he king hit the guy and knocked yep. him through the door. Mm -hmm. So his transitioning was relevant to that crime. And was was that a justifiable form of um, um, response? Or, or oh, look, I, I don't advocate violence in any no. situation. But you had to uh, prepare for the defence, did you? He pleaded guilty. It was really explaining yeah, well, to the court mm. how this had arisen. And uh, it turned out that he'd been in quite a few blues over the yeah. years over that issue, but did he turn first up? time charged. Did yep. he turn up in court? I didn't go to court. Oh, he would have gone to court. In a dress or... In all likelihood, <laughs> yeah. How do you explain the way the phenomena of trans has become such a big thing? Like, it never used to be. I'm sure you would have recognised back in your day, in the 80s, it wasn't such a big issue, was it? It's become this is probably not your area either, <laughs> Tim, but we're interested in your response. Well, you know, I, I think it's like we're all aware... Great, there's greater awareness now of everything. And, you know, people are podcasting. This is an excellent show. Um, social media, Facebook, uh, you know, television, radio, people are more connected in that way. Whereas, you know, decades ago, really the sole source of information was, you know, the, the Channel 2 news. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, you know, the old Herald. And, yep. And well, um, the Telegraph and the Mirror in Sydney. So. Yep. Uh, well, I reckon I got most of uh, what I said about you right. I, I, I read this uh, very, very carefully. This, uh, well, I appreciate and that. And the number of things that you have, the number of uh, vehicles that you've been on or the number of programs and you are consulted regularly for your opinion. Uh, I couldn't read them all out. We'd be here for 10 minutes. But um, you are very well regarded. I know that. And we Thank really you, appreciate you coming in and... Uh, just clearing up uh, some misnomers, maybe, of what goes through people's minds when they commit horrendous crimes and you have to try and sort it out for the defence, uh, not finding them uh, in their favour, but just trying to give an objective assessment of who you speak to. So thank you very much for coming in. Tim Watson Munro. A great pleasure. Sam Newman. Thank right, you. Thank, thank you. you, Tim. Thank you.